Hey, fantastic. So uh, with that, I think uh, now we're going to go to uh, James. Uh, <clears throat> James is one of our favorite academics. So um, I'll let you take it away. Do you want the handheld or the I'll take this. So that's true. I am a professor. Um, I can say whatever I want to say. And uh, and uh, I'm going to have to bore you with a little science and a little data. But uh, hopefully this will be helpful because I've been interested in developing treatments for uh, rare diseases. And I have two different uh, work streams. One relates to intervention in newborns and the other just generally uh, infants who are born with lethal or disabling genetic diseases. So I'm gonna talk first about a group of diseases uh, that were the topic of my first hour one 32 years ago. And we've stayed focused on this and gone through many different shapes and versions. But really have come to a very interesting deployment of genetic medicines for these diseases. And these are urea cycle disorders. Uh, babies are born uh, or often normal term uneventful pregnancy, but however, they're deficient in enzymes that break down ammonia to urea. And when they're challenged with protein formula or breast milk, they can't tolerate it. They develop coma and then can be very lethal in the neonatal period. It's X-linked recessive, and which means that primarily uh, males or boys are affected. Uh, in which they often have a complete deficiency. Just to illustrate that. This isn't working anymore. Let's go back. I'll, I'll keep trying and see how it goes. So, um, so the, these are tissue sections. It is actually an, an animal model of OTC on the left showing broad staining, which there's expression of the enzyme throughout, but in uh, affected males, there is none. 50% mortality at birth in most uh, places, and the only way there's survival is liver transplant. In females, uh, there's a random inactivation of the X chromosome, and you can see here in that tissue section, but there's sort of an intermediate expression of the gene and therefore an intermediate phenotype. So I want to share with you three different aspects of the disease that we've developed, uh, trying to develop treatments for, as illustrated by the uh, De Leon family, uh, who are uh, organized the patient advocacy group for uh, rare cycle disorders. Um, after three normal pregnancies, um, the family uh, uh, gave birth to a boy by the name of Jesse in 1990, um, uh, who, again, normal pregnancy, normal APGARs, but keep, became very sick, developed uh, hyperamnemia and coma uh, before there was really any effect of supportive care. And, and, and this young infant then died at three days, illustrating how fulminant this can be. 10 years later, um, uh, and during that intervening time at necropsy and follow-up and, and follow analysis, uh, the mom was determined to be a carrier. So when she was pregnant again, 10 years later, they did a uh, prenatal diagnosis uh, of, uh, of a fetus, a boy fetus who was found to be OTC deficient. So they deployed everything they could to try to treat that, that newborn, um, made it through the neonatal episode, and then listed the patient for liver transplant, which is the only way to really treat the disease. Now, their livers are normal, but they are just missing one enzyme. Uh, and Michael what, then underwent a liver transplant but died um, seven months later of complications of liver transplant, which is not easily done in young children such as this. And then uh, Ariella uh, uh, was their next child, uh, was uh, found to be a female, uh, less concerned about the severe form, but it turned out that she was a carrier and was fine until seven months of age, uh, at which time she started to develop symptoms. Uh, and during the time has been a very difficult uh, uh, situation for her and the family because uh, anytime there's a catabolic stress, she's at risk of hyperaminemia. Mom, who's a carrier at the time of menopause, uh, developed symptoms as well. So I want to share with you three ways in which we try to approach this disease. One is how do we treat uh, the heterozygotes or the later onset patients? How do we have better outcome uh, at the neonatal episode? And how do we prevent the need for liver transplant? So we're going to 
start with a little bit of a lecture of genetic medicines, and this is sort of a tour. Uh, where we're beginning with uh, with a hepatocyte that's deficient in OTC deficiency. And I want to talk about uh, what we initially did for uh, developing a genetic medicine for those uh, with later onset disease. And that's AAV gene therapy, which is basically what I've done for most of my career. And what AAV gene therapy will do is transfer a normal OTC gene into the nucleus of the cell and then express RNA, which then expresses protein. That DNA persists in the cell, but if the cell is rapidly dividing, it's lost. So this is uniquely positioned for, uh, for those after which the liver has proliferated to get stable expression, but not effective against the newborns. We actually uh, started a company uh, and have helped develop this product, and this is now in phase three. And in phase one, the majority of patients were really off most medical care. Now, it looks like it's really going to transform the life of these patients, but it's not relevant to the newborns because the liver divides and you lose the gene. So the next uh, uh, approach was how do we get a better outcome from the neonatal episode for which is so hard to manage? And we'll talk in the next slide sort of how maybe this approach to the standard of care could vary. Um, and this is where LNPM RNA, which we became very acutely aware of through, through the uh, um, pandemic, uh, may be used for rare diseases. And the advantage of RNA is it doesn't have to go to the nucleus and then make RNA. It just goes to the cytoplasm and makes RNA. So the onset is really quite rapid, really well positioned to have to treat an acute crisis. And so we, we came back about eight years ago with Moderna to develop a treatment uh, for rescue of hyperaminemia in the neonatal period or actually subsequent to that. Uh, and we've shown uh, this works in animal models, and they're bringing this forward for clinical trials soon. But then how do we prevent uh, the need for a liver transplant? Because this is transient, it only lasts during that acute period, and AV is not stable. And there we have deployed sort of the final platform, which is genome editing. So how does genome editing differ from the others? Well, a gene is introduced into the uh, into the nucleus, but then it's integrated into the chromosome. So as the hepatocyte proliferate, uh, it is passed on to the daughter cells and therefore it's a stable graph. And then that will uh, express RNA. So we've uh, evaluated this over the last eight years. We piloted this in 33 newborn monkeys and a variety of uh, models. We started a company called Eacure and we are now finished all the manufacturing done all the preclinical studies, and we hope to be able to report data in genome editing and uh, in neonatal OTC patients in 2024. So I was, yesterday we were told to think big, forward thinking. So sort of a dream of mine is, is, uh, is, is how we can intervene in these newborns who are affected, uh, have better rescue, and then uh, have a, a stable engraftment in a, in a normal life. So I'm going to um, talk about very briefly how, how this uh, diagnosis plays out because it's explosive and tragic. Babies, normal, APGAR, unless there was a family history, hyperaminemia after 24 hours. And if the patient is not acidotic, then there's a presumptive diagnosis of a urea cycle disorder, not knowing what it is. Uh, literally within a few days, the patient becomes uh, uh, comatose is in the intensive care unit. And every hour is precious because there's uncontrolled and uh, uh, hyperaminemia. Usually sent to a, a tertiary quaternary care center by helicopter and are hemodialyzed to bring the ammonia down uh, to stabilize them. So, so how would genetic medicines make a difference here? Well, one idea would be really more rapid onset of rescue so you don't have to transfer the patients and put a shunt in and dialyze them. Literally, that could be in the pharmacy, uh, a concoction of mRNAs for each of the four or five urea cycle disorders. We've done this uh, as a mixture. And then presumptive diagnosis of uh, hyperaminemia infuse this mix mixture of RNAs and you can stabilize them very quickly. And this could be present uh, in multiple centers. And then once the patient is stabilized, then you have a bespoke genome uh, genetic therapy, a genetic editing approach for each of the diseases. And this is really kind of a platform. You just plug and play the different genes. 
So we are talking about lysosomal storage disease. This is just a few last uh, slides about the work we've done here. This is the most mature platform of gene therapy that I think is out there and that we were part of developing. So appreciate the opportunity to be here to participate in your discussions about lysosomal storage disease. We've heard about enzyme replacement therapies being very successful in ameliorating some of the somatic manifestations of LSDs, but the neuropathic manifestations are really largely untreated, except in some situations of bone marrow transplant. So we've been working with health authorities, FDA and others, but how can we develop an approach for all of the LSDs or the storage diseases as a platform? And what's really important when you do that is you minimize the differences between your products. So we have a platform where we have the same vector, the same route of administration, which is in the uh, CSF and the cistern of magnum, the same manufacturing process. And then when we move from one disease to the other, we just cassette in a different gene. Hopefully then learning from the experience of one as we progress to other diseases. And one of the advantages of lysosomal storage diseases, as, as we probably heard throughout uh, yesterday and just wanna again highlight, is the potential for a cross correction. In other words, we do not need to genetically correct every cell uh, throughout the brain. Uh, we can probably distribute our vector around 10% of cells using the current technology, but those 10% can secrete an enzyme and then correct the other 90% uh, of cells. As shown here, the corrected cell is down in the lower left, and then the disease cell in the upper right secreting an enzyme and uh, correcting uh, those. So we, we again did many different animal models. I'll just share with you, and the next slide will be my last one example uh, of how we tried to pilot this and evaluate safety and efficacy. Many, many non-human primates. In fact, this factor injected in this route, we've studied in over 450 non-human primates in many, many different programs. We have a pretty good idea of the safety profile. Then we, I convinced the company that we started with Genix Bio to move forward uh, with this in the clinic. So we now progress on the left uh, through a variety of mucopolysaccharidosis diseases as illustrated here and on the right, gangliocytosis. Uh, and um, one of the advantages of these diseases is that there are really uh, uh, sort of what characterized biomarkers that we, begin, we, we can begin to think about for accelerated approval. So if we begin on the left, mucopolysaccharidosis, we now are brought into the clinic through Regenix Bio 2. Uh, one is in Pivotal, that's for MPS2, and one is finished phase one, which is MPS1. And I'll just briefly show you the MPS2 data. And for MPS3A and 3B San Filippo, we have clinical candidates that if we can convince uh, investors to give us money for, we can bring into the clinic pretty quickly soon thereafter. In terms of the gangliocidosis, again, the same approach, same vector, same route, just a different gene, we uh, started a company uh, called Passage Bio and uh, focused uh, that on, uh, on uh, gangliocidosis. And we finished phase one, two for DM1 gangliocidosis and uh, have open trials and enrolling the platform in CRAV A and MLD. And then preclinical data with Tay and Sandoff disease. We actually have seven other diseases that we could plug into the platform and they're progressively rarer. So the ones that you've seen for which we have investment, while they're all rare, they're less rare, but there's clearly even, even a line under which uh, even the most persuasive of us can't convince investors to invest in. So I'll just um, end by sharing with you just some data, but a really important study here on the platform was developed. Uh, we uh, partnered with Genix Bio and they brought this forward for MPS2. And again, it's, uh, early uh, uh, children who are at risk of neuropathology or have beginning to show signs, inject the vector once in CSF, distribute the gene, and get stable expression of the enzyme. And in monkeys, we follow them out at least for five years without any decrease. So one-time uh, intervention. Uh, and I'm just going, going to share with you the uh, data reported out for phase one, two. And what you see here on y axis is a biomarker, which is one of the substrates that accumulates because of the deficient enzyme, and it's elevated. And then you inject the vector, and it reduces in a dose-dependent way uh, into a, a appearing normal levels, and it's now stable out for three years. So really, based on these data, Regenix Bio went to FDA, and uh, they uh, had the nod of approval to proceed with their pivotal study, open label, natural history comparator arm, and of 30 subjects, 
and they're enrolling those subjects now. So real, real win for us and uh, and FDA, we hope, <laughs> able to show you the data that uh, this was successful. And we're now trying to draft off that for some of the other diseases. So then uh, finally, I want to bring something up that I've been talking to Peter Marks a lot about, and that is doing as much science as we can to justify a biomarker. And sometimes uh, preclinical models may be useful to do that. And I just want to show, show you one. And actually, it was Peter that suggested this to us in uh, some conversations that we had. This is a disease called Crab A, who could just be really accelerating fast disease. Uh, babies get sick very quickly if you don't intervene early. Uh, it's really uh, difficult to reverse what has happened. Uh, and we're enrolling a, a phase one, two study now. Uh, but there's a, a dog model, and, um, and there are animal models. And those of you in translational science, you probably heard uh, almost anyone can treat a mouse. Uh, but once you get into larger animal models, such as dogs and cats and others, it's more challenging. But uh, there is a great dog model uh, here that we've been able to show a one-time injection corrects the accumulation of a toxic metabolite called cytosine. And it has the same clinical phenotype. So I'll ask my colleagues here in the back to show you a movie of uh, a litter on the left. It's the 12, uh, 12 uh, this is the animal at 12 weeks. We treated both at 30 days. So this is an affected dog that wasn't treated, sham treated. Uh, you can see the dog's tremulous has lost motor activity uh, similar to what you see in patients and um, a few days after this due to humane considerations, the animal was euthanized. A litter mate was treated at a month, and this was at 82 weeks, if you could show uh, our dog there, and the dog's name is Aligo, uh, and, um, and really a stable correction, complete reconstitution of, of, uh, of motor function. So I, I do think we are in a, at, a, at a time when the future is now, um, in the OTC world, so more complicated, you have to intervene as neonates. They are often sick. Got to get them over that period. Uh, but there, we are making progress in the clinic and hopefully uh, drugs for the full spectrum there. And lysosomal storage diseases, I think, are going to be a paradigm in molecular medicine in, in how to develop a platform. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I look forward to participating in the